right from planting to harvest. We are constantly with the farmer to know what is going on, to give them tips on how to get better yields. And recently we actually launched a product to actually help them source for funds to even help them plant, right from even land preparation, planting, fertilizer purchases, all the way to. So we are constantly in touch with the farmers, helping them um, sort of expand their farms. Yeah. Thanks for joining us for another episode of the VC4A Founder Series. This is a podcast where startup founders share their stories of resilience and answer questions about the challenges and opportunities encountered during their entrepreneurship journey. This series is a collection of conversations with founders highlighting the ingenuity required to thrive in uncertain markets, make it through high friction situations and past crises. Each episode highlights a different founder and the unique set of challenges they are facing. My name is David Coleman. I am the growth lead at BC4A, and I will be your host. Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Founder Series. This time, we are lucky to have um, an entrepreneur who has been working on an agro tech uh, solution for several years now. Um, I know him personally. He's, uh, he's from, my, from my home country, Ghana. Um, so let me introduce you to Michael Okanse. Welcome, Michael. Very well, very well. Yourself? Good to have you with us, man. So, um, tell us a little bit about yourself and about AgroCenter. Okay. So, um, my name is Michael, like you already said, and I'm the CTO and co-founder of AgroCenter. And um, AgroCenter, what basically we do is, in very simple terms, we are here to ensure that farmers make more money. So anything that would make farmers earn more money, we are for it. But then currently, um, we do that in two ways, by helping farmers to sell at fair market prices, and then also by helping farmers expand their farms by providing them with access to finance, which they didn't have before. So um, I don't know if I should take you through how it all started with AgroCenter, but... No, yeah, I wanna hear it all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we woke up, we had a startup, myself and my co-founder, he's called Francis. We had a startup called Swapaholics. Swapaholics was all about butter trading. So um, we got the idea from, as you know, in Ghana, um, we like butter trading a lot. So if I have an iPhone 5 and I need an iPhone 8, but I don't have money to buy an iPhone 8, I just take my iPhone 5, top up with some cash, and then I get an iPhone 8. So we got that idea and decided to build it into a business. But after a year or two, it didn't really work out. So we just uh, scrapped Swapaholics. So we're like, what can we do? Just around that time in 2015, 16, there was a lot of noise about agriculture, like on the investor front, almost everywhere. The media were just talking about agriculture because we were like, okay, why don't we do some butter trading in agriculture, right? So that was the idea we, we wanted to, to push. And then we're like, no, let's not sit in the capital, assume that butter trading for agriculture will work, but then let's instead take a trip to the north, the northern parts of Ghana where it's um, about 14 hours by road from the capital. Let's go there among the farmers and hear from themselves what exactly their problems are. So we just packed one day, took a ride. It was a fun ride, actually. Uh, maybe we'll send you some pictures of that first road trip. <laughs> yeah, so it was, it was a fun trip. Uh, I had a Nissan Rogue by then. We decided to go with that. And by the way, the car came back and was never the same. <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine. <laughs> yeah. So we took a trip, um, stayed among the farmers for two weeks. And surprisingly, what we learned from them was they didn't have any problem with butter trading. They didn't even care about butter trading. The only thing they cared about was selling their commodities. So there were other institutions like USAID, they helped them farm, people give them grants. At the end of the day, they have so much harvest, they can't sell. So their biggest problem was, we want to sell the commodities. We're like, okay, this sounds like an interesting problem. So we went about now trying to solve this problem of 
helping farmers sell commodities. So one of the first things that came to our mind was, okay, the first thing that will come to your mind when you talk about selling will be e-commerce, right? So why don't we list commodities on a website? Um, look for people in the urban areas who need these commodities and then you can click, 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 buy. But we realized that, no, the lifestyle, within those two weeks, we realized that the lifestyle of the smallholder farmer is very different from somebody in the urban community, right? So any farmer, the, any money, sorry, the farmer makes, he spends immediately. That is if it comes in bits and pieces. So if you have an e-commerce platform where you've listed commodities, 15 commodities for let's say one farmer, somebody goes online and buys five bags of let's say maize. Now by the time somebody else comes to buy any number of bags for that same farmer, he would have spent the money he got for the five bags. So he would never have enough cash that makes sense for him to do something else. So farmers were just living hand to mouth. He makes a little bit, spends it on an immediate need and there's nothing else left until he has to wait for somebody else to come and buy. So we're like, no, let's instead find a way to buy everything from a farmer so that he can have enough money to do something else. So we started thinking, how can we buy everything from a farmer? Who needs that much commodity? Then we decided to think about these big institutions who somehow use so much commodity, but people really don't think about them. So an example would be, let's say a Coca-Cola, a Nestle, a Guinness, all those guys use, if you take baby foods, Nestle uses a lot of maize, wheat, all those commodities in large quantities. So we decided that, okay, now that we've identified companies that deal in large quantities of commodity, let's approach them and tell them that, hey, we know it's a lot of hard work for you guys to gather this large quantity of commodities on the Ghanaian market. We can do that for you, all right? So surprisingly, we entered, um, let's say we entered Guinness in the morning, the next day they were in agreement that, like, yes, we want to do this, an ad hoc contract with you guys. We thought it was going to be so difficult, but they had a problem of sourcing commodities, right? So if you are, saying that you can solve that problem why not they don't they don't lose anything anyway you're going to use your money to purchase mm -hmm. if it's the right quality they can just pay you so surprisingly we got a ad hoc contract from guinness and had no money to purchase commodities <laughs> the life of an entrepreneur <laughs> yes we had absolutely no money to buy commodities so uh, we had about a month to fulfill the order or else we'd lose that ad hoc contract. Now, once that happens, you've lost your credibility with, let's say, Guinness, right? You can't go back there. Mm -hmm. So, um, lucky for us, we were doing a lot of, the, during the time we were sort of building the company, we were doing a lot of social media posting on LinkedIn. So, our trip to the north, we were posting and writing stories about it. Almost every activity we perform, we post and write about it. So somebody, uh, an investor on LinkedIn, just around that time saw a post from Francis and he reached out like, hey, I'm doing something similar in Sierra Leone. I want to talk to you guys. So we went, luckily he was in Ghana at the time, uh, but he's from South Africa. So we met him and to cut the long story short, he gave us our first um, investment. Wow. Just within that period, with, with, without much paperwork, interestingly. Wow. So, How much yeah. was that first investment? The first was um, 100,000 USD. Wow, yeah. That's, yeah. That's, a, that's a serious injection. How old All was right. the company at that point? We were actually less than a year. We were just months old. Yes, officially months old. We had done one year of um, building the initial platform, doing more um, feasibility studies. But then when we actually registered the company, it was just a few months. Let's say we registered a company in September and the first investment came around August of the next year. So it was just a few months. Um, yes. So that investment was our lifesaver that allowed us to fulfill the order to Guinness. And then at least we had another LinkedIn post saying, yes, our first order has been fulfilled. So we took a picture of the track and then, so that is where it all, it all started with um, how we went into commodity trading, yeah. 
Wow. That's... I could go on and on with the story, man. No, I no, and and we're gonna we're gonna go into it because there's a couple of things about what you're saying that is very interesting to me. First of all, you said that you didn't want to just stay, you know, in Accra and make yeah. decisions because ultimately you were wrong <laughs> about yeah, what you they need. Very right? wrong. Yes. And so what how has that how has how has starting on such a good foot helped you? Mm-hmm. Are you still very uh, much engaged with the with the with the farmers? Yes, we we are constantly in in touch with the smallholder farmers. Uh, myself and Francis, we we rarely stay in Accra. We are mostly, and it's actually a lot of fun in the bush. Surprisingly, it's it's much more fun in the bush than in the office in the AC. Yes, because you sort of meet different problems all the time, right? So it's very, very different problems all the time. And it's so much fun. So yes, we are constantly on the field and we have agents who work with these smallholder farmers. The agents constantly visit the farmers. So um, before we started buying from farmers, what the typical middleman will do is he'll wait for harvest time, go to the village and then make his purchases. Between planting and harvest, they never go to the farmer, they never see the farmer, but then we don't do that. Right from planting to harvest, we are constantly with the farmer to know what is going on, to give them tips on how to get better yields. And recently, we actually launched a product to actually help them source for funds to even help them plant, right from even land preparation, planting, fertilizer purchases all the way to so we're constantly in touch with the farmers helping them um, sort of expand their farms yeah so i i like the way you started with the most the most in, the biggest need right yeah. they, they needed yeah. to just sell but then yeah. you started to kind of work your way backwards into their mm-hmm. lives and and how they make sure that they have enough money that they so that they so that they constantly have enough uh, um, stock of, of foodstuffs that they're, uh, that they're producing. Tell us about that, that kind of, um, how, how the progression of that, how did that progress? Yeah, so all that actually came about, like you asked, through the constant communication with the farmers, right? So we are buying commodities from you. Now we have a contract that is so huge that we need so much commodity to be able to fulfill that. But we realized that no, almost all our farmers are just doing one acres, two acres, one acres, two acres. And if I need, let's say, 50 metric tons, I might have to get about 10,000 farmers to fulfill just that order. We had just about 1,000 farmers who had 10 acres each, right? That would be more commodity from a smaller hand, uh, number of smallholder farmers. So we thought, why don't we help these farmers expand their farms? So instead of just being comfortable with one acres, two acres, why don't we just help the farmer go to about five acres, 10 acres, right? So it's these kinds of conversations with the farmer that brings out why they are not able to do five acres, right? So a farmer will tell you, look, the land is available, right? The family has land, the community has land. If you need land to farm, the chief will give you land. But the problem is really not with the land, but if I'm doing five acres, I don't have money for five acres of fertilizer, all right? So the money I have can only sort me out on two acres for fertilizer, right? And fertilizer, I think, is the biggest um, input cost in in the planting season. So seeds are fairly uh, not too expensive. They don't even sometimes buy um, certified seeds. They use grains from the previous harvest to plant for the next season, yes. So they tell you, look, we don't have money to expand the farm, right? So something like this, since we have a contract we need to fulfill now it's our responsibility to ensure that these farmers are able to help us fulfill these contracts okay so how do we help the farmer to now expand his farm his problem is with money so how do we then find a solution to help him have access to money okay so it's these kinds of constant interactions with the smallholder farmer that brings out the various problems they have along the line, right? So when a problem comes up, you find a technology solution that can solve that problem. So with what I was just describing, the solution we provided was, why don't we now find a way to 
get these farmers a digital footprint. So they were saying that, look, the reason we don't have money from banks is because the banks say that you farmers always receive payment by cash. There's no paper trail saying that you end this much over the, the, the year. So, and it's true. They always get cash, they blow the cash, no receipts, no, nothing, all right? So if I were a banker, I would be scared to give somebody like that a loan because I don't know how much he has earned. It's just word of mouth, all right? So they said, okay, now instead of paying our farmers cash, let's pay them using mobile money, all right? So every farmer who works through Agro Center, he would no longer get cash. So this sometimes even forced our farmers who were not having mobile phones, we just get a simple young phone just for mobile money purposes, all right? So- Explain, you, explain what a young phone is. I know what it is. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right, all right. So- a young, question. <laughs> a young phone is actually a feature phone, like the old Nokia 3310s that do nothing except make a call, receive a call, send text messages and nothing, play maybe Tetris, that's it. So uh, any phone that is not smart or any dumb phone, that we call it a young phone in Ghana. Yeah, so, and it's very affordable. So a lot of these farmers are able to, uh, in fact, a lot of the farmers could not afford surprisingly feature phones. So again, we went into a deal with Vodafone to be able to supply these farmers with phones that they can pay over time with um, uh, Vodafone SIM cards in them. So we decided to now go into partnerships that would help us solve the farmers' problems. We started paying them via mobile money. So now there was a paper trail of, sorry, there was a digital trail of how much they have earned over time. And we decided to build a product around this data, all right? So we have data of how much farmers have earned over time, data telling you which farmer is credible for credit and which farmer is not, which farmer does, more acres than the other. So this sort of data surprisingly was interesting to financial institutions. So a few of them, again, we were posting these things on LinkedIn. So a few of them reached out on LinkedIn and after several discussions, we decided to go with Ecobank's um, Pan-African Savings and Loans. So recently we just did a pilot in um, the Eastern region in Ghana with um, about 250 smallholder farmers with each getting about $150 loans to start with. So if the repayment rates are good, then we would upgrade them to more farmers and then a second tier of how much they can, they can earn over time. So that but, is how it progressed them. Yeah, so that's really interesting to me. Um, because you started off with the farmers and now you, know, you, solved, you started to solve their, their biggest problem. Then you know you're work, working together with them to actually grow their business, grow their wealth, and yeah. all of that. How has that kind of built that relationship? Because I'm assuming that there's going to be a lot of loyalty, and also you get a lot of data about who is mm -hmm. capable of. You know, you know who to. You should know who. To, you probably know who to go to by now, yeah. and yeah. and uh, where you can grow, and maybe you know what you need to leave behind. How mm -hmm. does how has that kind of worked? Yeah. So a lot of the, a lot of, sometimes during um, our investor pitches, they ask us, so how different are you from, or what advantage do you have over the current middleman? Because if you think about it, we are really a middleman, but a fair middleman. Yes. So the current middleman just buys at ridiculously low prices from the farmer. They just bully the farmers. And then we actually buy from the farmers at fair market prices. But the difference between us and the middleman, which comes to your loyalty question is, now the farmer just doesn't want money. Okay, yes, money is important, but then if you are providing the farmer other services apart from just buying his commodities, right? Even if somebody comes to him with a higher price for a commodity, you'll be surprised that because you helped him secure a loan for his planting season, he will not sell to the person, right? So they are more loyal to us in the sense that, look, these are guys who don't just buy my commodity, but also help me have access to loans, right? So it's like we have provided a suite of services for them that makes it hard for them to sort of 
not want to be a part of the network, right? And we have made it compulsory also now that every farmer who works with AgroCenter automatically we sign you up for pensions, all right? So again, this is something we did with um, one of the biggest pension companies in Ghana, enterprise uh, group of companies. So they also, so we sort of work with a lot with partnerships, all right? So we did with Vodafone, then Ecobank, Speed, Pan African, then with enterprise um, insurance, right? So we realized that, look, a lot of the farmers in Ghana after farming become a liability on their families, right? Already the family is poor. And then now you are out of active farming and then you are going to add to the troubles of the family already. So like, no, why can't a farmer, just like how it is in corporate work, I have access to pensions every month my, my, my employer contributes something to my pension so that when I go on retirement, I can have something small at least coming in on a monthly basis. Why don't we have something like this for the informal sector? Why don't we have something like this, especially for smallholder farmers who feed the entire nation? All right, so we're like, no, this is just not right. So now compulsorily, if you are a farmer who wants to work with Agro Center, you would have to have pensions, you sign up automatically for pensions. Now, that's because we want to ensure that when you retire from active farming, you still have something coming in on a monthly basis. So um, that is how we are able to tie farmers in to become loyal to Ago Center. Yeah. You're making it sound like, you know, it's, it's beautiful. It, it all makes sense, but it, it can't have been that easy, right? Yeah. How many farmers are you working with right now? Currently, we have 50,000 farmers. 50,000 farmers. And for our audience, how many people are, are on your team? <laughs> <laughs> our team has just seven people. Uh, seven people in the, in the office. It's four software developers, myself and Francis, six, and then our finance guy, seven. And then in the field, we have six warehouses, and each warehouse has a manager. Mm -hmm. So we have that. And then... Like I mentioned earlier, we work ex extensively with agents. Now, a lot for, for the audience out there who don't know, a lot of the smallholder farmers in Ghana are not very literate. So A, they can't use technology. B, they might not even have phones, all right? So why do you have a technology company building technology for a farmer who doesn't know how to use technology? It absolutely doesn't make sense, all right? Good question. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't make sense so yes we use a lot of technology but the technology is used on behalf of the farmer by the agent right so we have an agent uh, working in about four communities he's equipped with a smartphone that has our app on it he's equipped with a motorbike he's equipped with um, credit to be making calls to this farmer so that helps them become mobile when he visits a farmer, he has the app, he's able to now collect all data that he has to about the farmer, right? So all the farmer has to do is open his mouth and talk the way he normally does. And then it's the, <laughs> it's the agent who will now transform all that into um, the technology. So yes, we, we, we are using technology on behalf of the farmer. Yeah, I like that. But to go back to the, 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 the struggle that is every entrepreneur's journey, what are some of the really big challenges? I mean, there's, everybody's facing one right now, but what are some of the big challenges that you, you've, 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 the walls that you've hit as you've tried to grow? Yes. Um, some of the, well, the biggest challenge has been with money, all right? And money because we do a lot of purchasing. Now, how it works is you, you purchase from the farmer. The farmer wants his money there and then. There's nothing like come back in three days. He wants his money there and then. But then the company you are sourcing the commodities for will pay you after 30 or 45 days. Now, within those 30 to 45 days, you still have to keep supplying them with commodities, meaning that you need a lot of working capital to be able to do all these purchases um, to... to these companies. So 
one of the biggest challenges has been um, financing one. Another challenge has been, we are trying to let smallholder farmers, especially in the northern part of Ghana, where they've had a lot of projects. Uh, people have done so many projects and they are used to things for free. So somebody, USAID comes with a project and it's all funded, free this, free this, free this. So they've grown up with a uh, concept of agriculture has to have a lot of free things, but we are trying to let them understand that no, look, approach agriculture as a business, all right? So think about it that I'm in this to make money and not just to feed myself and then what is left I can probably sell on the market. No, I'm in this as a business. So I don't want to just get stuck on two acres, three acres. I want to get to like 50 acres, right? So that mindset change has also been very tough. That was it for the first part of our interview with AgroCenter co-founder Michael Okanse. Watch out for the second half of this enlightening conversation when Michael shares some sound advice for fellow entrepreneurs. Thanks for joining us today. If you're a startup founder looking for practical tips, check out the Startup Academy or connect directly with industry-leading experts through the Mentorship Marketplace. Be sure to keep an eye out for new programs and opportunities we make available as VC4A or boost your capital raising efforts by registering a fundraising campaign request. Our services are free for entrepreneurs, so be sure to sign up at vc4a.com. Subscribe to our podcast and join us again next time. Till then, work smart and stay safe.